Hi there. My name is Gregory Adam Scott, and this is my game, Armored Commander. Armored Commander is the World War II tank commander roguelike. Which I, when I originally started coding it, I heavily based the mechanics on the 1987 board game Patton's Best. As I continue, uh, continue to develop it, I feel like I'm adding more mechanics, and I'm going to be moving further and further away from the original board game. But that board game and the idea of playing it through a computerized version is really what got me going uh, programming this. So Armored Commander, it's a roguelike. Uh, it uses uh, text graphics. Um, it, it has permadeath so that in the uh, final campaign, as you play through, if your commander is killed, uh, or depending on the difficulty settings, if your entire crew is killed, your game ends. The point of the game is to survive. Um, as the commander of a Sherman tank in World War II, uh, fighting in Normandy and fighting on the Western Front, you are often outgunned by, uh, by German units, both AT guns, self-propelled self guns, and also tanks as well. So when you play Armored Commander, you have to keep in mind that oftentimes the best thing to do will be to use smoke, uh, movement, and cover to your advantage. You don't necessarily want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, with a lot of the German units uh, that you encounter. So let's get stuck into it. Uh, when you first load up the game, uh, you're not going to have a saved campaign, so the continue campaign option is going to be grayed out. Instead, what you want to do is you want to go and start a new campaign. Here's the little uh, flavor text. Now, in the future, there's going to be different campaigns available. At present, uh, the campaign that uh, Armored Commander in both Alpha 4 and Alpha 5 have are, uh, is based on that in Patton's Best. So you're the commander of an M4 Sherman tank. Uh, you've landed in nor Northern, Northern Europe, specifically in France. Uh, you landed as part of the D-Day invasion force. It is now July 27th, 1944, so um, nearly two months after the D-Day landings. After establishing a beachhead in uh, Normandy, the American forces are now trying to push out uh, from, their, from the area where they landed and push out uh, into France. And as I said, your goal in this, uh, in this campaign is to win as many victory points as possible while staying alive, and it's not always an easy thing to do. So let's continue. We have a nice little blocky image of a Sherman tank. Uh, in the future, I hope to get um, different images that, um, that reflect the different types of Sherman tanks. Uh, but for now, this is what we have. So first thing we can do, we can choose a name for a Sherman tank. Uh, if you can't think up a name or don't want to provide a name, you can hit Control R and you will get different um, randomly generated uh, tank names. Let's see if we can find a good one. Uh, of course, uh, Fury, just like the uh, recent movie. I also took a couple from uh, Rock Paper Shotgun, Shotgun's recent, um, well, not that recent now, I guess about a couple weeks ago. Um, they did a flare path, and uh, the author played through an earlier versions of, of Patton's Best, so I've incorporated some of his tank names in. But instead, yeah, let's go with Caribou. Caribou works. So that's going to be the name. Now, the next scene we, uh, the next screen that we see. Um, is part of what I'm calling the combat journal. Now, originally Patton's Best had a combat calendar, and every day of the calendar between the start of the action and the end of the campaign had different types of missions and uh, uh, a chance, a number. And if you rolled equal to or lower than that number on a D10, you would, actually, you would have action that day. Now, what Armored Commander is going to do is it's going to have a more procedurally generated calendar so that the way that things work out later on um, through August and September and through the campaign won't necessarily match up exactly what you might expect. So you're going to have to um, adapt a little bit more to changing circumstances. At present, however, uh, on the first day of combat, you're automatically brought in and you're automatically given uh, the, f the first type of tank that was included in Patton's Best, the basic uh, M4, which, I mean, the other Shermans, when you get up to the heavily armored ones, the jumbos and uh, the 76 millimeter guns, you're much better equipped. The basic M4 is woefully under-equipped, um, so it really it really throws you in and makes you think about how best to keep yourself alive. So today we're called up for action. Press enter to continue. I will. And here's a nice little uh, image. Are those some burning buildings in the background? A little, a uh, little foreshadowing what's going to happen. Uh, the time is 5 a.m. on July 27th, 1944. This is the morning briefing. So in the future, as uh, different types of missions, different types of sort of campaign days are added in, the text of this and the instructions uh, will change. Now on the bottom left here, you can see current weather is clear. I don't have uh, weather effects or weather generation implemented yet. Expected resistance for the day is medium. 
In other circumstances, it might be light or heavy, and the expected resistance for the day um, changes the likelihood of how heavy resistance you will actually run into in the different areas. Now, whether or not the day is expected to be light, medium, or heavy, um, you could run into any of those three, but for example, if expected, expected resistance for the day is light, you're going to run into less resistance overall. So press enter to set up your tank and load ammo. So here is the tank view. Uh, this is the same window as you will see uh, during the battles in the game as well. So, all, so the way that these things are laid out should be fairly familiar. Uh, we have the name that I gave to my tank, the model of the tank, so it's a basic M4 Sherman. Um, I don't yet have a screen to show you the specific um, armor values and, and sort of abilities and equipment on individual tanks, but I will eventually. Um, M4 Sherman doesn't have really much at all. It doesn't even have a uh, hatch for the loader, but I'll get into that in a moment. So up here we have a little note saying resupplying, so right now we can load as much ammo as we can fit uh, into the tank. On the upper right you see um, current numbers of ammo, both in general stores, and that's the first line, and then the ready rack. And that's the second line. And unfortunately, I don't have a line here showing general and ready rack, but by the time Alpha 5 is finished, it will be more clear. So ammunition types, HE, high explosive, doesn't do much to armored vehicles, but is much more effective against um, infantry and anti-tank guns. AP or, or armor penetrating, very good against armor, does absolutely nothing uh, against infantry. It's basically just a solid hunk of metal. You fire a solid hunk of metal into a group of about 10 guys, it might hurt one of them, but it's not going to take the entire squad out, so it doesn't really have an effect on infantry. Uh, white phosphorus, or uh, WP, smoke generation, and then HCBI, which I can't remember what it stands for, but it's another type of smoke. Uh, instead, in contrast, it, so WP produces smoke, um, but it's very dangerous to be close to. Um, it's actually, there's some question as to whether it should be classified as a chemical weapon. I think they got out of it because its main purpose is to produce smoke, but if you get hit with WP, it can cause uh, horrible burns, chemical burns to the skin as well. So in combat, American forces didn't use WP when they wanted to lay smoke on friendly units. Instead, they used um, HCBI. Now in Patton's Best and now in Armored Commander, the main difference is that HCBI produces a lot more smoke. But in the eventual campaign, HCBI ammo is going to be very limited. You'll only have, um, I think it's about between 1 and 10 shells available to you per day. So as you play through a day of combat, you really need to, to think whether you want to store up your HCBI shells and hold them for when you really want to lay down a lot of smoke, or whether you want to use them in combat. Down here we have a note on the main gun. So the M4 and many of the Sherman models use a 75mm main gun. At present, there's an HE shell uh, loaded into the gun, which we can change later. Um, I have set to reload after we, after we fire the main gun, reload it with HE as well, and I'm using the ready rack. Now, the ready rack has a capacity of eight shells, and the difference between the ready rack and the general stores is that if we use the ready rack, uh, we have a much greater chance of maintaining rate of fire. That means we can fire multiple times in the same turn. And if we're trying to take out a tank or if we're trying to take advantage of a, sh a really good shot, then we're going to want to maintain rate of fire. So, um, and then finally down here, smoke grenades. Uh, presently we have six. So I'll get into that when I talk about the crew. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start to load ammo. If we look at the instructions down here, we use the U, I, O, and P keys to move shells into gen general stores, and we can hold down Alt to remove them. And then just one row beneath that, assume, uh, assuming you're using uh, uh, the same keyboard as I am, you, you can press J, K, L, and the colon keys to move shells into the ready rack. So normally I'd be very limited in my HCBI, so I'm going to give myself four shells, and then move two of them into the ready rack. Now I'll give myself about 10 WP, two into the ready rack, and then the rest I'm going to put into high explosive and armor penetrating. Now in the future I'll have I'll, um, I'll make it so that you can hold down either control or shift or something to load in shells 10 at a time because otherwise it can take quite a while to load shells one by one. So now that I've loaded some into general stores I'll throw some into the ready rack using J and K. Now I don't want to because the, the ready rack has a max load of eight shells, I want some AP in there just because if I run into an armored target, I might want to throw some AP shells onto it very quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove one, let's see, one of the WP, and let's remove one of the HCBI. 
So we have two slots remaining in the ready rack. And let's throw two AP shells in there, get rid of an HE, and throw another AP in there. Because it's much more likely that I'm going to want to fire off a lot of rounds at once using AP. And now we can just fill up the rest of the um, rest of the general stores with HE and AP, and probably a little bit more HE because we use those a little bit more often. Now, in the original board game Patton's Best, sometimes you were ordered to carry more ammo than the Sherman could normally hold. And if your tank gets taken out, if it gets uh, knocked out, and you have extra ammo lying around, there's a much greater chance it's going to brew up, um, or either brew up or explode, and it can be much more damaging. For now, you can only take as many shells um, as you have as as you have space for, and that whole mechanic of carrying more ammo than you're supposed to um, hasn't been added yet. Okay, so we're loaded up with ammo. Let's take a look at our crewmen. Uh, these names are randomly generated. In the future, you will be able to select your commander's name um, from a list, so you get to choose it, and then you get to set their um, their nickname to be whatever you want, and the rest of your crew is going to be randomly generated. So we have a commander. Um, an armored commander, it kind of represents you, the player. Uh, that's why you're going to be able to, uh, to choose his name. Um, right now we have a column for their order, but since we haven't gotten into combat yet, they're not under any orders. Now, the commander, the driver, and the assistant driver each have hatches, and they can be either open or closed, and you just use H to, uh, to toggle them. Now, the hatch status affects a couple of things. For the one thing, it affects where they can spot. So in both Patton's Best and in Armored Commander, before you can fire at an enemy, you need to spot it. And if your crew is sticking their head out of an open hatch, they can see a lot more. So if the, if the commander's hatch is open, he can see all around him. If it's closed, you have to choose only one sector, and there's six sectors in total on the, on the combat map where he can spot. Uh, the advantage of having a shut hatch is that if there's light arms fire or artillery fire or something like that coming down, there's no chance that he will be harmed. Any crew member that has an open hatch uh, when your tank is hit, even if it's just peppered with small arms fire, the tank itself is not going to be damaged. But if they're sticking their head out of an open hatch, there's a chance that they will be injured. Um, but going into combat, I'm going to leave all the hatches open uh, so they get as many spot opportunities as possible. So the commander uh, sits in the turret of the Sherman tank. Um, he commands the rest of the crew and tells them what to do. Uh, the gunner fires the gun. Um, if they fire the gun, they can't spot. But in the first turn, you're not going to have fired yet. So the gunner can spot in, right in front of the turret. Uh, the gunner doesn't have a hatch. And in, I don't think in any of the Sherman models does he have a hatch. Uh, the loader takes shells and uh, reloads them into the main gun. In a lot of the versions, especially the earlier turret models for the Sherman, he does not have a hatch. In later models, they added a hatch so that he can pop it open um, and spot as well. Um, but at present, uh, he can only spot in, in one sector uh, per turn. Driver drives the tank, um, has a hatch at the front. If you close the hatch, he can only see out directly in front of the tank. Otherwise, he can see everything except directly behind the tank. And the same for the assistant driver. The role of the assistant driver is you can order him to pass ammo up to the gunner so that if you're not using the ready rack, you get a slightly improved chance of holding rate of fire, but not as good as if you used the ready rack. Uh, the assistant driver can also fire the, uh, the machine gun in the, fr in the front um, on, the, on the hull. Uh, the gunner, in addition, can fire the main gun. He can also fire the uh, coax gun, which is uh, attached next, next, to the, uh, next to the main gun on the turret. So from this screen, and this screen you can get to from, from the main ca uh, campaign interface as well, you can switch gun loads, choose the type of um, ammo that you want to reload, toggle ready rack use, you can to toggle it from ready rack to general, um, toggle hatches, select, select um, which hatches are going to be open and closed, and if you're resupplying, so at the beginning of the day or during a campaign, if you manage to resupply, you can also add new shells. So. We're ready to go, we've set everything up, we've loaded ammo, exit this view. Now this is something from the original uh, board game as well. So the idea is that you start kind of in the, in the base camp of the American forces. You are ordered to head out to an area to start and to move through it, to advance through it, engaging enemy forces as you find them. So you're ready at dawn, you set up your tank at dawn, and it takes you a little while to actually get to the front lines to get to the area where you're going to be engaging the enemy. So that's randomly generated. In this case, it took two hours, 
and along the way you expended four HE rounds and, and these are taken from general stores so you don't have to worry about refilling the ready rack and I think the idea is that you kind of if you suspect that you're running into something you might fire off an HE round uh, just to see or you might run into scattered resistance along the way but the only effect anyway is that you lose a couple rounds on your way and both of these both time and um, and ammo expended are randomly generated but they're they're fairly closely linked so so here uh, first instruction that you get is as soon as you arrive on the campaign map you can select an adjacent area to check for enemy resistance and this is something you can do later on but as soon as you start the campaign day you can do this for free meaning it's not going to take up any more time so this is the campaign view at the top we have a menu there's a help interface which I'm still building up but at the moment it has a couple of uh, handy keywords you can see today's date the current time so we, I think we started at 5 a.m. at sunrise, and it took us two hours to get here, so it's now 7 a.m. Weather is clear, but again, I haven't in implemented weather, uh, in, uh, weather effects yet, um, but that will change and, and be quite significant later on. Uh, the current mission, at present you can only do an advanced mission. Other possible missions later on are going to be battle, which is similar to advance, except you run into a lot more resistance, and counterattack, which is quite different. You basically, you don't move around very much, but you wait for the enemy uh, to come at you. Expected resistance for the day, again, is medium. Uh, at present, this doesn't change at all during the course of the campaign, uh, but later on it will be set um, by the different day. So right now the interface is telling us we can check an adjacent area. Um, we can use the tab key to cycle through adjacent areas. If we hit enter, it'll tell us what the enemy resistance level in that area is thought to be. And if we do backspace, we can cancel the action. But we're not going to cancel because this is a free action and it's not using up any time. So this in true roguelike fashion, the at symbol tells us where we are at at the moment. This is us. The start tells us that this is the start area, so this is where we have entered into the map. And the USA underneath tells us that this area is under our control. If we go into an area and we don't encounter any resistance, or we do encounter resistance and we defeat them on the battle, we gain control over that area. And capturing areas is a great way to gain uh, victory points. So at present, we only have control over our start area, but we can send out scouts and we can send out recce units to tell us um, what kind of enemy resistance we might expect in the adjacent units. Uh, sorry, in the, in the adjacent areas. Now if you look, each one of these little white dots represents the center of an area on the map, and the areas are defined by these darker lines here. Um, these areas, um, pretty clearly with the little, uh, the little green greebles in the middle, are forest areas. These areas right here are crops, uh, sort of fields and farmland. Um, because it's late July, I've colored these crops sort of, you know, coming into coming into ripeness and about ready to be about uh, about ready to be taken in. Um, if you play through the whole campaign, the, the colors won't change, but eventually they will. Eventually, you'll see the crops disappear as they're brought in or left to rot, depending on, you know, whether you're in a, a whether battles and, and war is going on next, next door. In the winter, once uh, snowfall happens, there'll be snow on the ground. And in the spring, the snow will melt, and you'll see different colors um, then as well. Areas with the little uh, lines in it, so this is supposed to be the stone roof of a house. This is fields and then little farmhouses as well. These are dirt roads that connect areas. And then if we scroll up a little bit, and you can use either the WS or the up-down arrows, if we scroll up a little bit, you can see paved roads that connect some of these uh, villages. And the villages are these sort of dirt areas with a couple little buildings. I think later on I'll change the depiction to show a few more buildings in the city, in the, in the villages, these sort of little towns, uh, to make them stand out a little bit more. Now, the presence or absence of roads makes a difference, um, and I'll show you that in a moment. Last thing I'll do before I actually do an action is scroll up to the top of the map and point out that this is our exit area. So if we capture our exit area, it gives us lots of bonus victory points, and then it will generate a new campaign map, and we can continue to go through um, until sunset, in which, uh, at which time we have to return to camp, and the campaign day ends. There's a handy little indicator down here that shows us time till sunset. is 12 hours and 15 minutes. And both the sunrise and the sunset time are generated based on, uh, the, the, based on the date. So as you go later in the year, uh, the sun is going to rise later and it's going to set earlier and the campaign days are going to get shorter. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check adjacent area for resistance. Uh, I'm thinking this is my exit area, so if I check this 
area here that might be one that I'd be interested in moving into. So I use tab to select it and then hit enter. So it's just come up and it's told us that medium resistance is expected in this area. Uh, it's not that great. I mean, especially with the starting tank, medium resistance could be very difficult for me to survive if I actually run into resistance. Again, these are expected resistance levels. You might end up moving into this area and find there's nobody there at all. The reports could have been um, in error or any German forces that were there might have pulled out by the time that you move into there. So as I was saying, the presence or absence of roads is important because if you look up here at the uh, different actions that we can do, to do what I just did, again, to check an adjacent area takes up 15 minutes of time. To move my forces, both my own tank, uh, friendly tanks and friendly infantry forces, the entire battle group, to move them into an adjacent area. If there's an improved road, so if there's a paved road, this dark gray here only takes 15 minutes. If it's a dirt road, so this light brown color, takes 30. And if there's no road at all, and in this case there's no road linking these two um, areas, it takes 45 minutes. So as you move around and you choose areas uh, to try to capture, you have to keep in mind how much time you'll be investing because as soon as you hit sunset in this day, um, it's over and you've lost any additional chances to make any additional uh, victory points. Another action you can do, and which I think I will do for this area, is you can call in artillery um, on an adjacent area and then you move into it. Now calling in artillery in original patents best I think if you, whether you did or not, you didn't have to move into it. You just placed a counter. But I've changed it in Armored Commander to say that you have to commit to moving into this area. And then it's, it's, it's basically up to luck whether or not you are able to call in the artillery. I think it's about a 70% chance of su successfully calling it in. Um, you can attempt resupply. So if we've gone through a lot of the day and, we, and we're starting to run out of ammo, we can call up resupply trucks. Um, and then at the bottom, you can view your tank which doesn't take up any time at all, and it just shows you the same thing, uh, the same uh, uh, window as, as we saw just earlier, except now we're not resupplying. We actually need to call in trucks to resupply now, but we can still change um, hatch status, ready rack use, um, ammo load, and stuff like that, just to get ready. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to try to call in artillery on this spot right here. And if it works, um, and there is an encounter, if we do uh, encounter real resistance, um, a lot of things are going to happen fairly fast, so I'll let, them, I'll let them run out and then I'll give you some commentary on them after we go. But I don't know if it's going to, if I'm going to trigger an encounter or not. So let's see. So I'll hit A, call in artillery, and by default the last area you selected on the com campaign map is going to be the one that's selected for subsequent actions. Um, but it's the same interface. You can hit tab and you can select any area you like. Um, hit enter to do the action or you can hit backspace and you can do something else if you've decided you don't want to do this action. But I do want to do this action. I want to try to call in artillery on this spot here. And this little line tells us that um, once I've done this action, my battle group is going to move into this new area. So I'll hit enter. And I was lucky artillery was brought in. So the artillery comes in and is going to give me an extra attack right at the beginning of the encounter, which is helpful because I'm just an M4 uh, tank with not a lot of armor. I need all the help I can get. So the window comes up and, it, and says we move into a new area, which takes 45 minutes. It took 45 minutes because there was no road connecting it. What happens? A battle encounter is triggered. So we thought there was resistance there. There actually are units. We run into some Germans, and now it's going to take us to the encounter map. And the first thing that happens on the encounter map is there's going to be an artil ar artillery attack because I was successful in bringing it in. Um, possibly then also an ambush, so a counterattack. So I'm just going to let this play out, and then, uh, and then I'll say something about it after it happens. So here we go. So spotted a truck, another truck, self-propelled gun. Not too bad. The self-propelled gun is the only unit that could cause some trouble for us. So because I brought in artillery fire, it's going to give me an artillery attack as soon as we start. If you just move into a new area without calling artillery, you don't get this first attack. What's much more likely to happen is that the Germans get an ambush attack on you, first off. So let's see what, what the artillery does. Destroys a truck. Good. Lays down some smoke. Lays down some more smoke. So not too bad. Um, the trucks are worth some victory points, but um, they're no danger to my tank. So the artillery attack is finished. What happens next? Uh, my tank has been ambushed, so we weren't able to get off the first attack on the German forces because they were, uh, they were ready for us. Um, but luckily, one of the things that the artillery attack has done has laid down smoke. So if this self-repelled gun here tries to do an attack on us, uh, it's going to be it's going to be hampered by the smoke in its in its hex. So that's going to be helpful. So let's see what happens. So the truck moves closer. I don't know why. SPG moves closer. That's good. It's moved out of the smoke. Now, after if there is an ambush, 
uh, the ambush actions happen first, and the enemy units could move around the map. They might move around the map, they might do an attack, they might attack friendly forces. There's different things they can do. Um, after an ambush, though, the first thing that happens is that there's a random event. And in this case, the random event is enemy artillery fire is coming down on us. So this could damage um, friendly forces, friendly infantry. Because I have left the hatches open, it could also injure some of my crew members at all uh, as well, but I hope it doesn't. So let's see. One friendly infantry squads are destroyed. Luckily, no effect on my tank. So I lucked out there. All right. Next phase is the spotting phase, and this happens at the beginning of every new turn. So that whole stuff, the artillery attack, the uh, enemy uh, actions, and then the, ran the random events, that was all kind of starting, starting steps. And now we get into the, uh, the, the turn cycle proper. So the first thing I need to do is, because my loader um, does not have a hatch and can only spot in one sector, I have to select in which spot, uh, sector he's going to spot. So in the original Patton's Best, there were six sectors, something I've, I've maintained here. Um, but what I've added is that I've added hex locations within the sectors as well. So in Patton's Best, this would have been one location, this entire band would have been another location, and this band out here would have been a single location. Now, this is divided up. So for example, at long range here, there's actually three different locations where enemy units can be. It adds a little complexity, and I think it adds a little bit more realism as well, because you don't get units a mile away that are moving you know, entire sectors in a single turn, whereas somebody who's close up might only move the same distance. I mean, the distance between here and here a mile away is quite different from only 100 yards away here. So using the um, arrow keys around here, I can select which of the sectors I want my loader to spot in. Uh, the most important thing for me to address now is not this truck, because it's not uh, a threat. I want to spot and identify, if possible, the self-propelled gun, which is right here. So I'm going to set him to spot in this sector here. And I don't have any other crew who um, has to choose one sector to spot in, so that's fine. And I'll just hit end, or you can also hit space, and we'll go to the spotting phase. So we'll see what my crew can do in terms of spotting enemy units. Commander spots the truck, good. And the commander spots and identifies the SPG. So self-propelled gun, it's a Martyr 3H. Uh, it's moving in the open, side facing. Um, at any time in the battle, um, when it's waiting for your input, you can right click over an enemy unit and it will give you, or should give you some information about it. Yes, here we go. So, Martyr 3 tank destroyer built on a Panzer uh, 38T chass chassis, very light armor all around. So, I don't have to worry about penetrating the armor on this one, just a regular AP, or I think so, uh, that sometimes even an HE might be enough uh, to take it out. And especially because it has its side uh, facing me at the moment. Unfortunately, it is moving, so it's going to be a little harder to hit than it would otherwise. So this is this is the beginning of the first um, sort of uh, section where I really need to make some tactical choices in terms of what I do. This Martyr III self-propelled gun has an extremely good anti-tank gun. It will cut through uh, a basic M4 Sherman's armor like butter. So. I think what I'm going to do, and as you play through the game and you get a sense of what your options are, your selections might change. But I think what I'm going to do is try to take it out, even though I've got HE loaded in my gun, which isn't ideal. I'm going to try to take it out using AP. Um, and what my commander is going to do is he's going to toss a smoke grenade out of his open hatch, which will place smoke in this hex, um, in my own hex, so that in the next turn, if the SPG fires back at me, um, I'll at least have a little protection and a greater chance that he will miss. Now, the bonus is that because he has his side to me, I believe that part of the AI says that if you are a tank or an SPG and the player fires at your side, um, in the next turn, it is much more unlikely that you'll fire back. It's much more likely that you'll try to move away. Because um, a lot of these German units, especially the tanks, have much lighter armor on their side. And if you can get a side shot on them, except for, you know, things like the Panther, if you can get a side shot on them, you actually have a pretty good chance of penetrating. Whereas with the front armor, it's almost impenetrable, uh, especially at medium and long ranges. So, uh, now I need to scroll through my crewmen and give them orders. So, Commander, what I want you to do is I want you to throw a smoke grenade. Now, throwing a smoke grenade is only possible for crew in the, t in the turret. Um, in this model of M4, um, only the commander has a hatch, and you need a ho an open hatch to throw it out of. 
So I'm going to give the commander the order and he's going to leave his hatch open. The gunner is going to rotate and fire the main gun because at present my main gun is facing straight ahead. What I need to do is rotate it um, 60 degrees, I believe, so to the next hex face in order to be able to, to shoot uh, the SPG. The hexes in medium range that fall between two sectors um, are a bit of a weird one. If there is a unit in one of these hexes, when you fire at it, um, it's quite generous. So that uh, when you fire at it, it will count either as being in this sector or this sector. Um, so if, uh, for this unit, for example, I could fire at it right now and it'd be fine. If my turret were, were facing this sector, I could fire at it, at it as well. It counts as being in both. When it fires back, and this is a truck, so it's not going to fire back, but if it were something else firing back, when it fires back, it's randomly determined each time which sector it's coming from. And this does make a big difference because with the smaller caliber guns, on the Sherman's front armor, I might have a fairly good chance of surviving a direct hit. Uh, from the side, I have a much lower chance. The Sherman side armor is still quite a bit lower th uh, than its front armor. So if there were something that could damage me in, in this hex, uh, it would be a little worrying because if it shoots back, there's a possibility it might come from the side and not from the front. But it's just a truck, so that's okay. So loader is going to load. Uh, driver is going to stop. So at present, I'm moving. So I was moving when the ambush attack happened. Now I need to choose whether I want to try to keep moving and make it harder for enemy units to hit me or if I just want to stop and fire back. Um, in the early game, you cannot move the Sherman, and that's either move forward, back, or pivot the hull and fire in the same turn. Um, in later, um, later Sherman models, you can get the gyro stabilizer and you can train your crew on it, and then that gives you the ability to fire and move in the same turn, albeit at a penalty. Um, but at present, if I want to fire, I need to stop, so I'm going to stop. And I'm going to close the hatch for the driver because uh, I don't want him to be exposed in case something could damage him. Uh, assistant driver, not a whole lot he can do right now because there's no infantry units around. He could fire the the hull MG at the truck, but honestly the hull MG is not that effective, especially at medium range and especially in smoke, so I don't think he's going to do anything, but he is going to close his hatch. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change my ammo reload type to AP, and I'm going to stick with the ready rack. So my idea is I'm going to fire an HE shell first, hope to hit and maintain rate of fire so that the next, uh, the next shell that I slam into the main gun is an, H is an AP, hope to hit with that, and then I can actually do some damage. I think hitting, hitting the, the Martyr III with an HE is not going to do very much, but at least this way I can, you know, I have a better chance. If I wanted to completely change the gun load without firing it, that takes an entire turn. So in this case, I can fire off a shell. Uh, it might be wasted, but at least I have a chance of then getting an, H, uh, an AP shot on him. So I think all my orders are good. So orders are finished. I'm going to hit end. Next thing that happens is that uh, select a new facing for the turret because I'm ordering my gunner to rotate and then fire the gun. Um, I can use the A and D or left and right arrow keys and it reminds me that there's a penalty per sector. Um, this refers to an older system. I've updated the to hit and to kill system to better re uh, reflect the original advanced squad leader system. So it's no longer a plus one penalty. Uh, I think it's a, uh, sorry, it's no longer a plus 10 penalty, it's a plus one penalty. Because Patton's best used a D100 system where you'd roll two D10s, whereas the classic um, ASL uh, advanced squad leader system uses two D6. And if you look through the percentage uh, charts in Patton's best, it's basically pre-calculated advanced squad leader odds. So I thought it'd be better just to use the, um, the, the true advanced uh, squad leader system um, as I develop armored commander. So let's turn the turret. We turn the turret one sector to face this nasty SPG. Turret is facing the right direction, so we'll hit end. Next, select a target for, for the main gun to fire. Um, if there were multiple targets that I could select, and I believe there is because remember this one counts as being in this sector as well, I could hit tab. So you can see they sort of light up with the selected color as I change uh, selected target. But uh, in this turn, I want to hit the SPG. Um, F will allow me to switch between area fire and uh, direct fire if this ammo load permits me. Direct fire means you hit the unit directly with the shell. Area fire means you lob the shell over and you try to get it in the general area of a unit. Area fire does not affect an entire hex. It does not affect an entire area. I was really unclear on what area fire meant until a couple weeks ago, and I'm glad I finally have it worked out. Uh, with HE ammo, you can use either 
direct fire or area fire. If you're firing at infantry units, especially at medium range, area fire is often the, uh, the better one to use. It also negates um, terrain modifiers. So if it's an AT gun or, uh, light, uh, or an infantry unit um, and they're in the woods or a building, um, it's actually very helpful to try to use area fire. AP, you have to use direct fire. Um, if you lob an AP shell and you get close, it's not going to do anything. So you have to use direct fire with this. Um, so any kind of smoke ammo, you have to use area fire because you're not going to hit it directly. You just want to get the smoke in the general area of the target unit. So again, I'm firing HE now, but I'm firing AP later, so I want to use direct fire mode because uh, this is what I really want to hit it with, the AP. So then you can, uh, at this point, if you want to, you can toggle use of ready rack. I want to use the ready rack because I want to take this out. And final thing to do is hit enter to fire. And as soon as it fires, uh, it's going to bring up a window um, that shows me the base to hit, the odds, and then it will do the roll for me. So let's see if I hit this enemy SPG with my first shot. Unfortunately, it missed. Um, this little window comes up when you either need to do a two hit or a two kill roll. Two kill rolls are basically armor penetration. Um, it tells you what's going on. So this is your Sherman. This is my name firing HE at a Martyr 3. Uh, base to hit number is 10 is because uh, it's at close range so that's 10 or le uh, that's 10 or less on a 2d6 um, unfortunately I had to rotate my turret so to my roll that applies a plus one uh, the tank is buttoned up that means that my commander is not directing the fire he's doing something else um, he's uh, throwing smoke so that's another plus one and the target vehicle is moving that's plus two so that's a huge modifier a total of plus four so what that means instead of in uh, what that means is that instead of a 10 or less to hit, I needed a six or less. And on a two six, I rolled an eight and I missed. Uh, rate of fire is um, not, the roll isn't displayed here, but it's worked out uh, separately. And I believe at present it's a separate 2d6 roll, which has modifiers based on use of uh, ready rack. And um, in this case, I didn't maintain it. Um, so that's the end of the main gunfire. So I lobbed off one shot, I missed. The only benefit I get out of this is that this unit now will have an acquired target put on it. Um, if I manage to get off a shot later on. So we'll continue. What happens, to, what do the enemies do? Uh, the truck moved. Okay, so in that turn, the truck moved one space. Um, the SPG didn't do anything. That's one possible um, AI, uh, um, AI action. In the friendly action phase, so the idea is that there's a lot of sort of friendly tanks and friendly units around me as well as supporting artillery. In the friendly, friendly unit phase, the truck was taken out and the uh, SBG had more smoke put on it as well. So right now there's smoke all over these hexes so it's going to be really hard to see or hit anything um, in this area. So um, he didn't move so he's uh, stopped so it now reads uh, stationary still has a side facing which is fine I don't think it really matters that much for the Martyr 3 because it has light armor all around and I have an acquired target because even though I missed I still tried to hit it last turn. Um, and as you'll see because I fired off, my gun load now, what the loader did is he re reloaded the main gun with an AP round, and from now on he's going to reload with AP rounds, so that's good. Um, so, um, spotting sectors, I've already spotted and identified him, so it won't have any impact, I'll just leave it there. And now I can reorder uh, my crew. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to close the hatch um, for the commander, and I'm going to change him to direct main gun fire. So this will give me a bonus to hit with the main gun. Uh, with the gunner, I'm going to tell him to fire because he doesn't have to rotate the turret anymore. Uh, loader's going to load, stop, and assistant driver is going to do anything. And I'm going to stay on. I'm going to stay on um, AP reload, and we'll see how that goes. Now there's smoke in both of these hexes, so I probably don't have a very high chance of of hitting, but I'm going to try um, anyway. So orders are set. Progress to next phase. Um, yes, I want to keep him as a target, and I want to hit, hit him with direct fire. Um, I have to use direct fire because I have H AP loaded, I believe. Yeah, if I hit F and I try to change to area fire, I can't, because you can't use area fire with AP. So it won't even let you. So fire off an another direct fire. Thankfully, I hit. So uh, still a close range. Base to hit number for the enemy is 10. I had a target acquired, which gave me a minus 1. Um, there's two smoke factors, so there's smoke factor in my hex and in the target hex that added a plus two, but my commander was directing the fire, and that gave me a minus one. So luckily, um, it ends up being a, a net zero dice roll modifier. So I just had to make ten or less to hit it. Um, so I got a hit. Unfortunately, rate of fire wasn't maintained, so I don't get to take a second shot um, right away. But I got a hit. So 
let's see what happens to the hit. And if you do maintain rate of fire, you need to fire off all of your shots before you see what the result is. You don't know whether the shot will actually damage your, your enemy target um, until you've finished your firing. So let's see what happens with the two kill roll. Very nice. So the two kill roll, um, the target was hit in the turret, and in this case the armor is so low that I think I basically need a, a 12 or less on a 2d6, so the target is automatically destroyed. Great! Um, Alright, unfortunately, after the SPG was destroyed, in the random events phase, um, there were some enemy reinforcements that, reinforcements that arrived. This means the game spawns um, a new uh, enemy unit, and in this case it spawned a LW, which is light weapons. It's an infantry squad. So now I have to deal with this. Um, so the commander at this point, because his hatch is shut, he can only uh, spot in one sector, so I want him to spot in the sector ahead of, the, ahead of him. The loader, and if you have multiple crew members who can only spot in one sector, you can use WS or up-down to, uh, to select them. Uh, the loader can also only spot in one sector, so I'm going to move him over and try to get a spotting chance on this light weapons unit as well. So that's good. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes, I mean, there's a lot of terrain and stuff going on on the map, which is not actually shown in the hexes. In this case, uh, the light weapons team has turned out to be hidden, so I can't fire at it, but luckily it can also not fire at me or my friendly forces. So at this point, what I think I want to do is the... Um, hidden status is not going to change unless either the enemy unit moves or I move. So I'm going to open up my hatch for the commander. I'm going to tell him to direct movement. So he's going to um, stick his head out of the hatch, look around, and help the driver do what he does. And he's going to try to reverse into a hull down position. Hull down is very helpful. It basically means that the hull of your tank is behind something big and solid. So that if somebody hits you with a shell, um, and it would have normally hit your hull. Instead, it hits the uh, the stone wall or the hill or whatever, and you're not damaged at all. Getting into a hull down position, assuming you don't have to move afterwards and lose it, um, can be very helpful. So the driver is going to try to reverse to a hull down position. Um, the gunner is going to do nothing because uh, he can't he can't do an attack against a hidden unit. Um, but the loader. It's going to change the gun load because AP isn't going to do anything um, against uh, a light weapons. Um, actually, the gunner can do one thing. He can rotate the turret so that I don't have to worry about rotating it later on. So, orders are done. Um, because I gave the gunner, uh, or rather because I gave the loader a uh, change gun load um, order, I can now select what kind of shell I want to put in the gun, and I want to pick HE. Um, next thing to do is to select a new facing for the turret. So we'll face it straight ahead. That's good. Hidden light weapons didn't do anything. It, would, it was hit with smoke. And then finally, it was hit with um, friendly action. So either uh, friendly tanks or, or friendly infantry forces um, uh, destroyed or scattered it um, uh, using their attack. So all the enemy units are gone. The encounter has ended. Um, now it shows me the encounter menu with a list of the different types of units. Um, in this case, I took out one self-propelled gun total, which is good but not great. Um, friendly forces took out one, either uh, one light weapon squad, so these are infantry squads, and two trucks. Um, so that is a total of six victory points that I earned and three victory points that friendly forces earned. At the same time, um, there was one infantry squad that was lost to enemy action, which gives me a total of uh, six victory points altogether. Because inf if you lose an inf infantry squad, you lose. Uh, three victory points. So it went from nine down to six, uh, which isn't bad for a day's work. So from here, because the encounter has ended, the only thing we can do is return to the campaign map using escape. And because I captured this area, I get an extra two victory points. So that's good. So if I look on the campaign menu now, it tells me my current victory point total is eight. Um, present time is 8.15, so that counts the time that we use moving into the area and the battle itself and now the time remaining till, until sunset um, is 11 hours. So this is how the game runs. I can continue to move um, to check adjacent areas to tell me what kind of resistance I might expect. I can check multiple areas before moving in. Um, I can try to call in artillery before moving into an area or I can just move into it. I can capture um, towns which are more worth more victory points, move along roads, and try to capture my exit point uh, before sunset which will give me a whole bunch of bonus 
um, victory points. And at the end of the day, it'll tell you um, the total victory points you got for the day, and then it'll take you to a new campaign day. And now at present, as you move through the days, they're all pretty much the same, but in the future, you're going to get different types of missions and um, different levels of, of resistance um, as, as you move through. So I think that's all I want to review uh, for this um, video. Um, and I'd encourage you to take a look at uh, armoredcommander.com, which I'll link in the description to this video. Um, try out Alpha 4, and I'll do my best to continue working on Alpha 5 um, and try to get it released. And if you have any kind of uh, feedback or suggestions, I'm more than willing to, to read about them. Um, I'll, uh, just, um, I think on the main armoredcommander.com page, there's a link to the forum thread on Temple of the Roguelike. Uh, there's a thread there for Armored Commander. And if you have suggestions or uh, bug reports or anything, uh, just post it there and I'll take a look. So thanks very much for uh, taking a look at my game today.